uh, them on his screen and so uh, you can let us know when you'd like those slides advanced and we'll just give a moment here for uh, Corey to get those slides set up uh, for sharing them and then we can welcome Sandra. So Sandra, feel free to uh, turn on your video. Just, oh, my video's not off. Okay. No, I just I just unmuted you. Hi, Sandra. Um, did you want to turn your video on? There you are. Hi. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, so can you see your slides there? Corey's got them shared and just let him know yes. when you want them to be changed. Okay, I can see the first one. Awesome. And thanks for that great intro. Uh, there's not much more that I have to say to that right now. Uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, container gardening and more specifically growing food in containers. Uh, growing food or anything in container is really near and dear to my heart. We, I've, I've been on a huge journey with this. Um, many years ago when I first came to Saskatchewan, uh, over 25 years ago, previously I'd lived in uh, Calgary and Toronto and the weather was a lot milder in Toronto and in Calgary, you know, there was all those beautiful Chinooks that came up. So, you know, the weather didn't seem as bad, but when I moved to Saskatchewan, the winter months was brutal for me. I mean, I found the winters to be long and cold. Uh, now they don't, now the winters have seemed to have gotten a little milder nowadays and I'm not sure why that is, but I did struggle a little, those early days I did struggle with, um, you know, coping over the winter months. Uh, some people call that seasonal affective disorder. And so I found uh, something must have gone off in my brain to just remind me of my childhood and, you know, all the fun things we did with uh, nature and plants and, and, you know, how it made me feel uh, when I was a child growing up. And so I started uh, potting up plants and growing them indoors. And uh, over the winter months, that really became a lifesaver for me. Um, it, that's not to say that uh, potted plants or indoor gardening is going to, or container gardening is going to take away your winter blues, but it certainly helped me to alleviate a lot of the, the symptoms that I was having. And um, so one of the things that, um, some of the things that I kind of reached back into my childhood for and kind of grabbed was uh, some of those, oh, advanced slide please, <laughs> was um, uh, some of my memories of nature and plants. And I was, I was, I was amazed to find out that uh, the poinciana tree, which is that red one on the slide there, uh, the pods that are hanging down, the black pods to the right of the tree, um, and then there's tamarinds underneath. Uh, uh, they are, they're, they're used in Worcestershire sauce. They're great little fruits. Some of them can be uh, really sour. Some can be really sweet. And of course, good old caragana, Saskatchewan, caragana that's everywhere in, in Saskatchewan. I found out that they were part of the same family, if the, the Fabaceae family, and that really intrigued me. You know, the, the Poinciana tree is, um, is a zone nine and uh, Carrigan is two to seven, uh, but who knew? Uh, they're part of the same plant family. And so uh, that was just something that I felt, you know, many years, even though I only found out about this many years later, I, you know, it's always, it's always so cool to, to find out about all these little things in nature that are so connecting and, um, and no matter where you live, there's, you know, plants of different families and, and they survive in their climate and you can survive in other climates as well. So over the years, I've, you know, um, it wasn't all just bad in the first few years. I employed other strategies over the years. So now, you know, I walk in the wintertime. Uh, I love the sun, the warm sun on my face on a, on a, on a winter day. Uh, I go snowshoeing. Uh, I mean, I've embraced winter a lot, as, as along with other strategies for um, uh, for, for winter survival. Um, and so, fast forward many years now, uh, I grow lots of things in containers. Um, I grow food in containers. I also have a community garden bed that I grow, and I have uh, raised beds in my yard that I grow uh, food out of. But uh, the, the natural transition from growing stuff in containers in the house um, gave me the confidence I needed to say, well, if you can do that here, you can do that there. So I started, I started growing food in containers. Advanced slide, please. So uh, what some of the considerations uh, for me, the, so the benefits, uh, let's talk about benefits first. I, uh, the versatility of being able to grow things where you want, when you want. The beauty of plants growing, in, uh, uh, food growing in containers. I mean, I love seeing huge zucchini leaves. Uh, I love seeing every, anything growing in containers. When the peppers and the tomatoes are starting to bloom, it's just 
to me, that's beautiful. And um, uh, people who've turned their, their city yards in, the, in Saskatoon here in food production, I really admire them because uh, it looks, to me, it looks amazing. And uh, food is always sexy in my book. Anyways, um, so, um, oh, pardon me, there's <laughs> someone's humping outside. Um, and so when you're scoping out your situation, uh, you want to know where uh, your sun is. Um, because the sun is largely going to depend on what uh, you can grow. Um, not, that's not to say if you don't have great sun, you can't grow a lot of things. You're still able to grow things like herbs and lettuce and um, chives and arugula and uh, Swiss chard and kale and those things. But certainly having six to eight hours of sunlight is, uh, is going to give you some optimal growing conditions. Uh, you want to also scope out for that nasty wind. Uh, uh, wind can be uh, a, tr a troublesome thing. Uh, I've had that on my deck. And so my solution for that is I always put my, um, my big planters on casters or wheels. Uh, I remember me and Zoe picking up some at um, Princess Auto um, a couple of years back. Um, and I just kind of roll them out of arm's way when, um, you know, inclement weather comes up. So I've rolled them out of the way when hail comes, uh, when it's too windy. Um, so be mindful of, um, if you don't have plants on rollers or you're not able to do that, be mindful of the wind because the, men, the wind is also uh, a very menacing thing. It can come and it, it just really dries your plants out real fast. Like, you know, they transpire real fast. Um, and they suck up water lots, and so that you're out there, you're constant, constantly watering, especially if you're um, you're planting in shallow containers. Um, you also want to be mindful of where uh, of the shade. So if the sun is uh, right in your in your space at noon, you know it's a good it's a good um, possibility that you're going to kind of have the sun um, most of the day, um, depending on if your neighbor has a tree that is going to pass over or if your house is going to be shading it. So just be mindful of the, uh, the, the how the sun travels and where you're going to, and where it's going to end up and where your plants are going to be in, in terms of all that. Uh, so yeah, be mindful of wind. Be careful, know where your sun is and um, know where your shade is. Next slide, please. So another thing, so we, yeah, as you can tell, you can grow food anywhere. I mean, if you have a small patio, if you have a balcony, if you have a side yard, even in your front flower beds, uh, in between your ornamentals and on your, um, on your driveway, food can be tucked in anywhere and, and look, just look as pretty and nutritious. So uh, that's a potato bag with potatoes um, that you can just set on your deck. This one comes with a little lever that you can uh, lift up and, and reap your potatoes. Um, those are plastic looking terracotta pots. Uh, these are definitely more lighter weight. So if uh, weight is a concern for you, um, you know, as far as the, the material goes, uh, you might want to opt for uh, plastic or fiberglass is a little bit lighter. Um, uh, ceramic or glazed ceramic, those always look so much prettier and nicer, but um, uh, as far as uh, practicality go, when you're going for a larger scale, uh, you may want to go with something like, um, like uh, plastic or um, fiberglass. Uh, one thing about if you're going to be planting on, say, uh, a balcony and you're new to the place, um, I wouldn't advise a huge production of like lots of um, lots of fruits and veggies and a huge production. You know, you know, start small because you want to know about the weight of your balcony as well. Like, is it um, is it is it uh, sturdy enough for like a huge scale production that you're thinking of, or you know, you know, maybe you should scale that back a little, or just find out from the building owners or your condo owners if you know what the what the load bearing capacity is for your um, your balcony. Oh, and then there are some strawberries in a in a nice strawberry basket. There's nothing as as gratifying as being able to just reach up and pick fresh, fresh fruit right off your deck. So, um, yeah, these are just a couple of the containers. Um, advance, advance slide, please. Yeah, uh, here's some more here's some more ideas. Um, uh, there's a strawberries again, but this one's in an urn. And then here's a little pocket of um, for vertical gardening. Uh, these are some herbs and lettuce that are just actually growing up on a wall. So you can, if you have something like this, you can have a pouch like this, it can actually just be on hooks on your wall and facing the sun. And then here's um, a galvanized tin that uh, some lettuce has been planted in. Um, I use this material uh, quite frequently. I always plant my lavender in this galvanized tin. And what I find is, oh, uh, one thing about containers, they should always have good drainage. 
it's essential uh, because when that rain comes and floods things out, it's 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 hard to go backwards from that. So make sure that you have um, drainage holes in your containers. So the reason why I plant um, lavender in, um, in these uh, galvanized tin containers is I find that they get really pull the heat, which lavender really, really likes. And the lavender likes to be dried out anyway, so I don't have to uh, water as much, but it kind of just intensifies my heat for the summer um, so that I get more of my lavender. I also bring my lavender indoors in those same containers. Um, I do have some woolly, um, woolly lavender right now that is still going well. Um, from being brought out, um, brought inside from last summer. And uh, I also have, uh, what do I have, rosemary and lemongrass. So those are some of the um, herbs that actually overwinter well. And I mean, they're thriving. So um, I don't have very much luck with mint or thyme. I think they need to go through some kind of um, a, a shutdown season. Uh, well, especially the thyme, I think, needs to kind of go through a cold spell. So um, I find that by December, I'm just not looking so well so I just kind of usually just dry them and and use them that way. Advanced slide please. Oh and here's some beautiful Swiss chard. I mean look look at that. Look how beautiful food can be. It doesn't necessarily have to be flowers. You can you can just you can use get a, all that hit of color really from um, just from the foliage of your uh, of your vegetables. So you know the brighter and the more robust you color you know the nutrient content is Pretty, pretty strong there. Uh, those two red and yellow containers on the left, they have a mixture of ornamentals and food in the same container. Um, there's some reasons why you want, may want to do that. Uh, you may want to do some companion planting. Uh, just because companion planting is um, either it invites uh, good beneficial uh, bug, um, insects to your yard um, or pollinators or um, it deters pests or it helps with the bigger and the health of your other plants. So definitely when you're planting in containers, um, companion planting is something to really think about because it can use it to help you to maximize your yields. You can use it to um, repel bugs. And um, yeah, you, can, you, you won't go wrong with companion planting because it, it's gonna help here. And, and reduce, the, and you won't have to use pesticides, which is, which is a nice sustainable uh, practice. Advanced slide, please. So here's actually blueberries do very well in containers, uh, like a small uh, small blueberry bush does really well in, in containers. Um, and again, here's some lettuce and some nasturtiums. Uh, nasturtiums are edible flowers, and not only that, they are also uh, they are also beneficial to other uh, plants in your in your container. And those crates, uh, a cool thing happens when you can. You can actually plant in crates and make sure you line it with coir or something like that to make sure that the water doesn't uh, seep out. Um, or you can, I've seen laundry baskets with the holes in the side. I've seen uh, people drill holes all over containers in the sides. And really what happens with those kind of um, containers is a cool thing called air pruning. So usually when you buy uh, a plant in a container, you'll notice that when you, when you pop it out of the container, the roots are all wound around in the container. With, um, with air pruning, what happens is the roots don't go around the container. Uh, once they hit the humidity on the outside of the, at the edge of the containers, they start creating more fibrous roots. And what that does is it helps the plants to uptake more water and nutrients. So uh, it's a cool thing to try. Um, I've done it uh, right now. I actually have a, a, an ornamental grass that I planted in a felt uh, container that I overwintered in the house and it's still doing well. Uh, some of the lower leaves are starting to dry, which I, I expect to happen. Uh, plants are not gonna look their greatest when, you, uh, when you're overwintering them all the time. But once you get them back outside in their environment, they usually just um, snap right back. So with the air pruning, uh, it just, it's a really great idea because it, um, it just, it helps your plants to take up so much more nutrients as opposed to, you know, kind of hitting container and, and going around. Uh, so if you're gonna go blueberries, uh, they like to be acidic. They have uh, like acidic soil to be, to, to be productive. And so you can, you can make uh, amendments to that, but I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the soil uh, section. Advanced slide, please. Oh, we're at the soil section. Okay, all right. So uh, I like this quote, um, healthy soil, healthy plants, uh, healthy plants equal healthy food and healthy food equals healthy people. Um, 
Another one of the strategies that I use as a, for, for helping me over the winter months is making sure that I eat good food. And so that definitely led, into, led, for, led to continued gardening. Um, what you, your soil is so important. It's the most, you know, I've talked about the light first and I've talked about the containers, but essentially the soil is your most important thing, that consideration that you're going to make. Um, poor soil does not yield good food. Um, and so you want to make sure that your soil is, is good. And so um, uh, topsoil with triple mix, uh, if you're going to be in raised beds, um, I actually mix um, triple mix, um, uh, call your peat. I mean, so this is not peat from the peat bogs. Um, I would advise against using peat from the bogs because um, that's an endangered resource that's going on right now. Most of the world's um, peat, peat bogs are located here in Canada, and uh, they are they're disappearing at an alarming rate. And so I would advise against using peat as any kind of an amendment. Co uh, coconut coir is uh, a much better choice. It has to travel a far distance, yes. However, it's definitely a renewable resource. resource. I mean, there is a lot of coconut trees in the world. Um, so koya is a derivative of the coconut, um, the coconut plant, and everything just kind of mushed up to a small, uh, small. So it looks, it looks. Sometimes when you see the two of them together, peat and koya, it's hard to um, to differentiate them. Uh, they do both. Um, uh, koya is pretty inert as well. It doesn't have. It's it's basic. It doesn't have. It's not acidic and it's it's not alkaline. It's it's pretty basic. So adding it to uh, your containers is is pretty safe. Um, another alternative to that, if you're able to make it, and it's, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of it around. Come fall, there's a lot of leaves, and you can make leaf mold. Um, it doesn't sound very sexy to say leaf mold, but leaf mold is amazing. It's a great soil conditioner. What happens is you gather up your leaves over the uh, fall, and you put them in some plastic bags, and you water them down nicely, and then you just poke some, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of holes in the bags, and then you stick them in a nice shady uh, location. Uh, leaf mold will take about, it can take one year to two years to break down, but if you actually shred them with, um, with your leaf blower or if you, with your lawnmower uh, and get them into smaller pieces, they'll break down faster, and you can also use that as a, as a uh, peat um, alternative as well. Um, uh, leaf mold in itself does not have a lot of nutrients, but wow, what it does for your soil, it helps, it has good water uh, holding poten um, potential, and it actually drains well. So um, that's the best of both worlds. And so it helps your plants to take up nutrients better, it helps your plants to stay hydrated. And so leaf mold is a great, great option if you're able to just make some on your own. Uh, one of the things that I always add to my containers is um, worm castings. I add that to all my indoor containers. I add that to all my outdoor containers. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of plants, uh, I have to say. <laughs> That's just one of my things. Um, if you know me well, you know that I have a lot of plants. And worm castings come spring here. All these indoor plants here will get a nice little top dressing of worm castings just to get them going for the spring again. And um, I like to add like a, a, a cup or two in my when in my pots when I'm mixing them up. And, um, and I also add biochar. Um, you may not have heard of biochar, but it's, um, it's also another product that I've been using for about three, four years now. You can get it at the uh, Early's um, Dutch. Uh, actually, I've never gotten it in the Dutch. Uh, Early's has it though. Um, so what it is, it's actually organic material that has been heated to like over 400 degrees, but with, uh, very in low oxygen. So what that does is it creates these little pockets all over the all over the material where it holds on to nutrients till it's needed and then it releases them to the plants. So by itself, biochar is inert. So you have to charge it when you get it. So you can use worm castings, you can use compost tea. Uh, you just when I say charge it, you just mix it in with um, with these other things that are that are high nutrients like worm castings or anything else that is going to be kind of a, um, oh, you can mix it in with compost, anything that is going to be a natural fertilizer. Um, and I tend to stay with the natural fertilizers. Um, if you, you can go to any plant section and, and make those choices. Um, 
I myself try to stay away from the uh, the yellow and green package just because um, because I've, I've, I've weaned myself off of it. So I'm kind of okay now. Um, sometimes my yields are not as much, but I'm okay with that. Um, just because I'd rather not, uh, I, I, you know, it, it is what it is. It's just a personal choice. Um, so when I go out there and uh, spring comes and I have everything gathered around, I have my big blocks of koya that I, you have to, by the way, the koya comes in big square blocks that you have to re-wet to get it to the consistency of, of, uh, of peat. So uh, you'll, and it re-wets a lot better when you use warm water. Um, not, that, not to say that if you have a huge block of it outside, it's gonna, it's gonna be cold water, it is what it is. You just wait that out and, and, then, you, and then you use it. Um, uh, if you're looking for like a good, just a basic uh, soil mix, I like to use, uh, say one part one part uh, coir or um, leaf or uh, leaf mold, one part um, sand uh, like builder sand, good sand, not sand that gets put in in the, in the toy box, and um, and uh, and a part of compost, and that that helps to kind of give uh, the structure that the plants need to be firm, uh, the drainage capacity, the water holding capacity, and the nutrients that that you need to get things going. Oh, what haven't I talked about over here? Okay, advanced slide. Okay, so another thing, watering. Uh, where are you going to site your containers? Because uh, do you want, if you're going to be on a balcony or, uh, you know, know that you're going to have to, you know, travel your water out there in a can and that's fine too. Um, so be realistic about your, about your, um, your lifestyle and how gardening fits into your lifestyle. Because if you are someone who's busy and um, you're always running around, um, you know, you may not have time to be uh, watering a lot. So you're probably off, better off going in a large container, uh, a large container, then you have your lettuce and whatever you want in there. And you can always plant lettuce on the side around other big plants. Um, the one thing to, to note about large containers is the perimeter always dries out first. So sometimes you go to water your containers and, you know, you know, habit force says, oh, let's start watering in the middle. But with your large containers, you want to focus on the, on the, around the edges first, because those are the areas that dry out first and to just get those, um, get those re-wetted um, so that uh, everything is nice and, everything's nice and, and wet. Um, uh, for as along as well as um, so this setup here is a rain barrel. Um, you can there's many different varieties, different options for that. Um, the city of Saskatoon does offer a twenty dollar rebate for um, for rain barrels and um, compost bins. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, in, you you may be eligible for um, for a rebate if you do purchase these um, these items. Um, uh, also for watering. Um, advanced like these, you can set up a uh, uh, a drip irrigation system. Uh, this one's this is a nice this is a nice productive uh, garden, and so you know the the the, um, the drip irrigation is just added uh, to go into all of these containers, and then it comes from one central source, and it just slowly soaks into the soil. So not a lot of it gets evaporated out and, and, and wasted, it actually goes to the where it needs to go. Um, another thing for planting in containers is um, mulching. Mulching is huge. The same benefits that mulching has in the ground uh, when you mulch your, your garden, your bedding, your plants in the, in the beds, uh, it provides the same benefits in containers. It's going to uh, regulate your temperatures in the container. It's going to um, maintain a bit more moisture. It's going to um, keep, you know, just kind of keep everything nice and 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 protected there for you. Um, that's also one of the another benefit of growing in containers. You don't have to weed as much, <laughs> which is my favorite. You don't have to weed as much. Um, I see weeds pop up here and there. Sometimes it's in the in the potting mix or in the triple mix or whatever. Just pick those out. Those are just one or two, and most times the containers are high enough that you know you don't you're not bending over back breaking labor the whole time. So it's no biggie to pick one or two weeds here or there. Um, advanced slide, please. And so uh, throughout all this, I uh, just want to say uh, um, we'll be talking about um, some 
this slide is a little premature, but we'll talk about it at the end. But there are no gardening mistakes. They're only experiments. And um, as the Horticulture Society said before, I totally agree with that. Just get out there and try something new. And, and if you fail, you fail. That's is now you know what not to do next time. And so um, I always try to just embrace uh, all parts of gardening. And um, and yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out. Like my raised beds last year, um, the carrots, I don't know what, what, what was up with the carrots. They were stunted and they were very sweet. They tasted good because I didn't reap them till after the first, um, till it got after the first frost. So they were super sweet because they'd set their sugars. But mm, they are not big at all. But anyways, that's that that's neither here nor there. Um, so some sustainable practices, definitely. If you can, rain barrel is awesome. If you if you're if you can do a little bit of a compost bin, and I mean that's uh, just throwing your, your kitchen, uh, creating a little mesh area where you can throw your, your kitchen scraps in with some with some browns, you know, some leaves and whatnot down, and just kind of turn that, um, you know. If you can try that, that's that's excellent because it's going to help you um, help you um, add nutrients, good nutrients to your um, to your your containers. As far as um, as far as overwintering plants, um, you're not going to be able to overwinter a lot of um, plants in your containers because typically they need to be in the ground. Um, but uh, if they're two or more degrees uh, warmer. And so say we're in a zone 3A, 3B, right? So if you're if they're good to like a, a 1A, 1B, you might be able to overwinter plants in containers if you plant a little microclimate in your yard. And a microclimate is just a little area that is in your yard, it's kind of protected. It usually has rocks or something close by where that, that ambient heat is available to, um, uh, to kind of make the, the area a little bit milder. So you can certainly try that. Uh, as far as uh, sustainable gardening, again, I always try to use uh, stuff that is local, stuff that is that I can make myself. Um, I know there's a lot of um, I know there's a lot of uh, products out there that you can you can use for sure. Um, but as much as you can make for yourself and you know what's in it, um, I find that to be to be good. So the soil that I usually use in containers, unfortunately, they already do come with peat. Um, that's what it is. Whenever it says soil in any of those bags, there is no dirt in them. It's just all um, organic matter that has been squished up and, and manipulated in some way. Um, so my, my options for, um, for containers is uh, sunshine mix number four or else um, uh, HP. Uh, the high porosity, the pro mix with the high, the high porosity pro mix, it actually has mycorrhizae in it. And this is something that is, um, is good for the roots to take up more nutrients and water. So it gets your plants going well in, in, in the season because it really helps with that root stimulation and root growth and root um, taking up um, nutrients. So that's what I, I use. But even if I do use those, I always mix in a little compost, a little worm casting, and a little biochar. <laughs> just, just my habit for doing that. Um, and what else? Have I covered everything? Uh, let's open it up for some questions. Um, I likely spoke too fast and glazed over a lot of things I wanted to say. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sandra. Um, there is a question already in the Q&A, so I'm just going to open that up. It's from Cheryl. Um, Cheryl asks, have you tried growing zucchini or other squash in containers? No, I haven't, but it's certainly something you can do. You can actually use um, trellises, uh, or uh, trellises for lack of a better word, so, so you can train them up so that they go uh, up on a trellis as opposed to be sprawled over. And for things like that, it's always good to go, not always, but going with the bush varieties is actually not a bad idea because they stay a little bit more compact and they're not as sprawling. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to consider the, the trellis and how that will work with your container for sure. Um, yeah. Something that you didn't touch on that I wanted to ask about, or I'm sorry if you did and I missed it, but was um, container size and how you suggest choosing a right. size for the type of plant. Thanks, Zoe. Welcome. <laughs> I knew I was, I knew I'd over something. So, <laughs> you know, 
when it comes to container size, definitely size matters. Uh, you want to make sure that your potatoes and your tomatoes are in good size containers, like, you know, four, four or five gallon containers where they're, you know, they're going to get enough soil, enough nutrients, um, and to, and enough support for their roots so they don't topple over, especially if you're, if you have a windy situation. Uh, things like lettuce and Swiss chard, they can definitely be uh, grown in shallower containers. Um, you know, we're talking about 12, 24 inches. Um, th those are good for that size. Um, but yes, definitely uh, potatoes um, and your tomatoes, you wanna make sure. I've actually seen people grow corn in, in containers, but you just wanna have enough root depth. You wanna make sure that uh, the container is large enough to uh, manage your root size. Um, and for as far as carrots, I wouldn't recommend carrots because they have a long tap root. I mean, the, a carrot's roots go on for, can go on for like a mile almost because uh, they're that long. So uh, car carrots are definitely not a good option um, for containers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing another question being typed in here. Uh, so there's a question that is, do you have problems with fungus gnats using the vermicast as a top when you're using the vermicast as a top dressing in the house? No, I've never. Uh, I have, the problem with fungus gnats comes from uh, soil being too wet and, uh, and, um, and moss, kind of like, uh, is that what I'm trying to say now is, that green stuff that, that grows on your soil, moss essentially. Yeah. yeah, so you they feed on that. That's their, they love moss. So as long as you're not keeping your plants too wet, um, you will not have an issue with fungus gnats. That's another thing. If you do buy those big bags of um, potting mix, make sure that you're sealing those after you use them because fungus gnats like to go and live in there too because they have food sources in there. So I've had um, containers, that, um, bags that I've gotten and I and I had just kind of, you know, just kind of rolled it up and tucked it under, mm -hmm. but make sure that you secure them because fungus gnats will make their way in there and, and have a nice little feast yeah. and multiply like crazy. No, so no, I have not had any problems with fungus gnats and wood castings. Really good point about sealing the bags of soil. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. I think I did too, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any other questions here, but if folks do have other questions, feel free to type them in, or if you want to ask a question live, uh, you can use that raise hand feature and we'll, we'll get you on the screen here. Um, I'm just seeing if I, I made some notes as you were speaking, Sandra, and then each time you, as I wrote a question, you answered it, so I crossed it off. <laughs> Okay. Means it was an excellent presentation and very thorough. Um, so you did kind of touch on it just briefly there when I was going to ask you if there's anything you would not plant in containers, and you definitely said carrots. Um, are there other types of, of vegetables or food crops that you would recommend that they don't do well in containers at all? Mm, that's the only. That's the only one. Like you know, uh, I've seen where people say don't plant beets, and I, I don't. I've never planted beets in container. I plant them in. I plant them in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, carrots are the only ones that I can really think of, but anything that really has a long taproot, mm -hmm. actually, um, horseradish, well, you know how that comes back just on its own every year, it's, it, it just comes back here because it's very prolific. I find that that one has a taproot, but you don't, you wouldn't put that in a container anyways, you'd want that kind of in the ground where it comes back so you can, you can use it, but no, I can't think of anything else as far as, I think if you just give it a whirl, if, a, if the container is big enough, just give it a whirl and and see where you get with it. And um, those big cubes of soil that you, um, potting mix that you can get from um, Rona and Canadian Tire and those places, it's really a huge compact uh, cube. So when you open it, you, you actually get a lot, a lot of soil out of it. So it's very cost effective. It's about thirty three dollars that you that and it it can it can fill a lot of containers. Okay. And then for compost, the city of Saskatoon out Eleventh Street has. Um, Free compost, you just, you know, bring your shovel and your bucket and you can take as much as you want. It's a great resource. I'm, I'm glad they offer that. Yes. I remember looking years before they started offering it. I'm like, other cities are doing this. Why aren't we? And then yeah. and a couple of years later, I'm like, yes. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, you mentioned, you talked about mulch in your presentation. Um, what type of mulch do you prefer to use for containers or in general? Okay. So you can just you can use leaves, you can use um, uh, you can use uh, bark chips. 
The only thing about bark chips is that sometimes they'll rob the, the nitrogen from your soil, right? So you have to be careful that you don't actually uh, dig it into the soil, but just uh, simply just lay it on top as a cover. Mm -hmm. And actually leaf, uh, leaf mold makes also a great, a great mulch because of its water holding capacities. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, you can use leaf mold. Um, yeah, leaf mold, leaves, yeah. Um, straw. You can use anything that you would normally use in the, in the garden. Uh, the only thing about straw is one year I went and got some straw from a gentleman off of a farm because I was trying to overwinter some veggies and you want to check those over before when you get them really well because it brought slugs to my yard. Oh shoot. Yeah, brought slugs. Yeah. So if you're going to get anything like that, I would just say look it over really well before, yeah. you, before you bring it into your into your space because uh, sometimes there, you know, there's buddies that you don't want to, <laughs> you yeah. don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> so this be every summer going Definitely. through, and, you know, picking them because now I have slugs. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Yeah. It's not, not that bad, though. There's another question here from uh, Cheryl. Um, she says, I might have missed this. Were you going to say something more about soil for blueberries in a container? Oh, OK. Yes. So you soil, you want your soil to be uh, uh, to be acidic. And so uh, you can add a little bit of um, lime to that, or else you can uh, try to find um, potting mix that say that it has a little it's more on the acidic side but definitely they do same as hydrangeas they like that acidic soil to give you that nice blue color mm -hmm. and yeah that's just a, that's just a, 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 a soil amendment that helps to, to do that a lot of people like to get their soil tested to find out exactly what they're working with mm -hmm. um, I think the university does that mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, but you can go and get that done there um, I'm not sure the cost of it but if you're having issues in your in your whole yard, um, it might be worth some. It might be worth doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another question in the chat, um, wondering about what other kinds of unconventional containers have you seen used, such as the laundry basket, as an example. Oh, milk crates are a huge one too. Uh, many years ago, I, I watched. I think I was still a chef. Oh, and I'm back at chef again, so I'm happy <laughs> for that. Um, milk crates are like a really cool one because you know they already have the perforation already. Mm -hmm. So just kind of line it with like a, a cloth or something, and then put, so you put everything in there, and the milk crates work. Mm -hmm. I was driving uh, with my daughter earlier, and I saw her on Eighth Street. They must have had a thousand milk crates. I'm like, oh, that's in those. I imagine those would be very good for the air pruning that you talked about. Exactly. That's what they're for, the air pruning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything like that. Milk crates, um, anything that is just has a nice structure, but um, has cutouts all around it. It's right. good for that. Uh, we have another question here. Um, wondering about using rocks in the bottom of containers for drainage. Is this a good idea? Is there anything else to use? I wouldn't recommend it at all. Uh, uh, what I've used is old pop bottles because <laughs> oh. they're light. Yeah. Like, so, like, well, I shouldn't say old pop bottles, like just pop bottles, uh, plastic ones. Uh, and I just kind of load that up in the bottom. One year, I didn't have a lot of stuff, but I did have a whole bunch of firewood. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I just use what I had. I just, I just kind of, you essentially just trying to build it up to, so the, the, the soil level is a lot higher than mm -hmm. if, if you don't need that depth. Yeah. Um, which is oftentimes uh, with my one container at the front. So I think, and I think over time, what will happen is that wood will break down anyways at the bottom of my containers and, and just feed that soil. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend rocks at all. Not rocks. No. Uh, oh, and, and people sometimes use packing peanuts, you know, those little white packing peanuts that, oh, are, yeah. that come with your packaging. Like That's when you order on Amazon, don't throw those away because you can totally use those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I wonder when you mentioned the pop bottles, is that like the big sort of two liter ones or the smaller ones? And do you use them whole or did you cut them? No, I use them whole, just toss them in there just for bulk. Yeah. Um, bulk and, and lightness and, and whatever you want, yeah, whatever size. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a thank you from that question asker. Thank you for the all the ideas. <laughs> all right, you're welcome. That's great. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions here. Um, we have, you know, a couple minutes left, um, but uh, I really thank you very much for, for being here, Sandra, and uh, for giving us this, this tour through container gardening today. Um, I have been admiring the plants behind you as well. They look lovely and very healthy. So oh, uh, 
Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah they look That's great. <laughs> Pardon? That's just one or two of them. Yes. <laughs> no, there's more. Um, but thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have to kind of go like this when I'm passing the plan section. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know what I you mean. <laughs> Um, but anyways, thank you so much for presenting for us today and for sharing all of your knowledge. We really appreciate your time and thank everything you. that you shared with us today. Um, it was a very informative presentation. So thank, thank you. Kevin. you yeah, really nice to see you. Nice to see you. See you uh, in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay, take care. Bye. All right, uh, so thank you again to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the presentations. We will be posting uh, these on our YouTube um, channel. We're just at Chep Good Food on YouTube, um, as well as I'll share the links on our Facebook page sometime next week. It'll take me a few days to get the recordings um, uploaded. So if you do have others that you think you might wanna share this information with, or you wanna rewatch portions of it, you'll be able to do that. Um, but I really thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking the time to spend your Saturday with us. I know it looks like it's uh, at least very sunny out there. I'm not sure on the temperature, um, but I've got this lovely sunshine coming in uh, my window right now. So I hope that you enjoy the rest of your Saturday uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for giving us sort of that CD Saturday feeling, even though we couldn't be together this year. Um, we really appreciate you. We hope you have an amazing time gardening. If you do have questions or suggestions for CHEP on other educational content, um, Sandra is actually joining us again as a member of staff as our garden educator this summer. Uh, so she'll be available to help answer some questions and providing some workshops throughout the growing season. Um, so we're really grateful to, to have her back as well. Um, I think that's it for today on my end, but thanks again for being here and uh, take care and have a great rest of your day. Bye.